Hey, hey, hey. Time for another Out of This World story from our space. Romance fraud, also known as relationship fraud, occurs when the fraudster pretends to be romantically interested in the intended victim. After gaining the victim's affection through various lies, expert manipulation, and often exploiting the victim's vulnerabilities, the fraudster then uses that affection to take the victim's money. It can happen to anyone, and when it does, it can put people's lives in danger and have devastating consequences. Today on Our Space, we hear from a victim of romance fraud who came out with his life but was left with a broken heart. Chapter 1 I'm Dr. Bailey, and six years ago, I was made to believe my life had taken a picture-perfect turn. I have always believed it was for the best until four horrible weeks ago. As a 35-year-old practicing doctor earning seven figures and a mortgage-free house and cars to my name, I was the envy of most since I am considerably living the American dream. Jasmine, my beautiful wife, was the best of everything I had. She made me complete and gave my life its actual meaning. Growing up in different hostile foster homes made me more of a loner, and med school made a proud geek out of me. The girls I dated either found me interesting during lab practical, and that was all lost after the first hangout outside the hospital walls. But Jasmine, she made me believe it was different, glaring and crystal clear from day one. In those five years we were married, I would march to work every morning, confident and happy in my six feet height, slightly curved shoulders, and well-lit brown eyes. I became a role model to most of the medical trainees and even my colleagues. My life was near perfect because I knew nothing was ever perfect, but my life was just a few inches away, or so I was made to believe. The past few weeks had been a nightmare for me. I would have argued this, and of course I did argue it with David, whom I will tell you more about later. I have experienced things that would have made me violent and angry, but I am a doctor and prefer the subtle ways of handling things, especially regarding marital issues. Before we go into the gory details of how I unveiled the long history of my cheating wife, let's go down some memory lanes together. Exactly six years ago, I met the woman who changed everything about me. If there was something called love at first sight, then this was what she had made me believe our love story was about. I had gone on yet another dinner date with my ex-girlfriend Phoebe and Bella, a co-nurse at the hospital. I had found out about Phoebe cheating on me with a junior and our relationship was way over the cliff. This dinner date was my way of honoring Bella, who was trying her best to get us back together. I had always had a phobia for one thing, cheating and unfaithful partners. I frowned at any form of cheating, and I always made this known to any woman I was going out with, Phoebe inclusive, that it was a turnoff for me. We spent the hours with me trying to make them understand my viewpoint about infidelity, but Bella was defiant, pleading I give Phoebe another chance. While at this, I noticed Phoebe had resorted to cries, giving Bella more grounds to bank on to make me change my mind about my breakup with Phoebe. I was still in the middle of this uninteresting conversation when I saw Jasmine walk into the restaurant, hand in hand with another man. She made the air around her stop with each step she took towards our table. Obviously, they had made reservations for the seats beside ours. She took her seat, facing me directly, and her date had his back turned to us. Perfect. I must have missed out on what Bella was saying because she pinched me that second and in a not-so-gentle way, causing me to wince in pain, jerking out of my transfixed state. Of course, I apologized to the women at my table for not being a gentleman and tried my best not to get distracted, but I couldn't. My eyes kept wandering off to the blonde facing me. The seat arrangement made it near impossible not to look at her as she laughed and talked with her man across me. The sudden chills I got from the red wine Phoebe threw at me made me feel like the worst man on earth. Bella was also just as furious at my display of disrespect, you are unbelievable, she yelled before she snatched her bag off the seat and ran out of the restaurant with Phoebe. I couldn't lift my head from meeting the approving eyes of the other couples in the room. They wouldn't understand I was the victim anyways. I grabbed a tissue and wiped off the wine streaming down my head from getting into my eyes. When I regained my confidence, I lifted my head slowly and I was shocked to see the subject of my distraction staring in my direction. Her date was not there. A sweet wave of excitement filled my stomach and I smiled sheepishly at her, then waved shyly. She smiled back. It felt like it was just the two of us in the room. Every other person was lost to me. Then she invited me over. Without a glance towards the accusing eyes, I knew were watching us. I joined her at her table, and we started talking. From our talk, I got a quick detail into Jasmine's life. She's an American actress, born barely five years after me, and brought up in Houston. 
She was determinedly different. She had such confidence and such exuberance that drew me more into her charms. I had truly never met anyone like her. She also had told me how her date had been cheating on her and she was tired of it. When she informed me she had broken up with him that night, and I was happy because cheating should never be pardoned. I went on to tell her about Phoebe's cheating too, and how much I detest being cheated on, and just like that, we, two lovers whose love had been betrayed, found solace in each other, and as I looked back, I could see how convenient that was. We left the restaurant when it was almost closing. The other couples had left, and I was relieved a great deal. We hailed a cab, I gave the address of my flat. We rode the short journey to my place while we chatted along. When we arrived and got to my porch, she gently pressed her soft, rosy lips to mine. I pulled her toward me, and we kept kissing as I fumbled with the key to the front door. We were scarcely inside before undressing, stumbling into the room, and falling onto the soft bed. That night was one of the most erotic nights of my life, even though I had a long list of girls in my life, Phoebe inclusive. I spent hours exploring Jasmine's body and didn't even realize it. We made love all night until dawn. Afterward, we lay there wrapped in each other's arms. Jasmine was facing me, her eyes so close that they were out of focus. I gazed into a hazy green sea. Well, she said. That was terrific, I replied, panting. Before Jasmine left, she took a shower. While she was showering, I phoned Phoebe since I was so enchanted with my newfound lust. I wanted to arrange a face-to-face -face conversation with her as I was moving on, but she was still pissed off about the previous night to see me and insisted we have it out then and there on the phone. Phoebe was no doubt expecting me to break up with her, and that was what I did, as gently as possible. She started crying to guilt trip me and became even more upset and angry because I was not the one who had the blame. She was. I hung up on her. Brutal and unkind, yes, but she never should have cheated on me to start with. I'm not proud of that phone call, and my friend David would not let me hear the last of it days after I informed him. But after telling him about how I found out about Phoebe's infidelity, he had my back. David was the closest friend I made practicing in Boston after med school. He had been assigned a case with a patient I treated, and along the line, we connected and had become friends. However, I later found out he had stayed away from me not because of work distance, but because he never liked how fast my love life with Jasmine had gone. Throughout the week, Jasmine and I stayed in touch. In her company, I felt unfamiliar happiness as though a secret door had been opened, and Jasmine had beckoned me across the threshold in a magical world of warmth and light and color. Jasmine did that for me. She was my invitation to life, one I grasped with both hands. So this is it, I remember thinking. This is love. I recognized her love without question. Clearly, this felt like something I would never have experienced. Every time I heard Jasmine's contagious giggle, a wave of excitement ran through me. I absorbed her youthful exuberance, her one self-consciousness, and joy. I didn't recognize myself. I liked this new person, this unafraid man Jasmine inspired me to be. I was consumed with a perpetual and urgent hunger for her. I couldn't get close enough. Jasmine moved in with me that September into my apartment. Our first Christmas together, we were determined to do it properly. We had gotten a mini-sized tree from the stall. I remember so vividly the scent of pine needles and hardwood and scented candles burning, and Jasmine's green eye staring into mine. Because it was the moment that changed my life, I spoke without thinking. The words just came out before I could stop the, do me the honor, love, marry me. Jasmine stared her jade green eyes at me. What? I love you, Jasmine. Will you marry me? Jasmine laughed, and I was so scared she would turn me down. Then. To my delight and amazement, she said, Yes, Bradley, but you must get a ring. Slip the pretty thing on when you have it. I was thrilled. The next morning, after work, I picked up Jasmine after rehearsal, and we went out to choose a ring. We got married barely three months later, with a sulky David as my best man. Being married to Jasmine was heaven on earth, and my faith in the supreme being rekindled. Her presence in my life was timely. Whenever I felt so alone and scared, Jasmine was always there to get me through it like a magician. I felt such humility and gratitude for every second of our marriage. She had me believing how lucky I was to have such love. Of course, we didn't have kids running around after five blissful years, but we never let this strain our relationship. We were medically certified healthy and perfect to conceive. 
which I believed would happen when it happened. Our IVF procedures all came out futile, and we stopped after three failed attempts because of the depressed state it left Jasmine. Each time we talked about babies, I was always assuring Jasmine how much I loved her, with or without a child in the picture, and she would hug me so warmly to thank me for being supportive and understanding. The first time I sensed our ship was getting underwater was in late March, a few days after our fifth anniversary. I had gone on an emergency call at the hospital earlier that morning, which lasted way into the evening. The second I got out of the changing room to the car, I got a text from Jasmine about our dinner plans. I needed no watch to tell me I was hours late, so I dialed her phone instantly, but it went straight to voicemail, which was not unusual since she keeps her phone on do not disturb mode during rehearsals. I drove home tired and craving a steaming shower, a warm meal, and Jasmine's sexy body underneath mine. The lights in the house were out, and I felt a pang of pain throughout my body. Jasmine was not home. I sulkily made it to the house and found a sticky note taped against the center table, explaining she had to take a last minute rehearsal appointment for their upcoming show. I sighed, squeezed the note, and tossed it away, consoling myself with the meal she had kept in the warmer for me to heat up. After the shower, I went to the kitchen and served my plate. I ate silently, scrolling through my social media feed, missing my wife. Nonetheless, a post about wine got my attention, and I suddenly felt a thirst for a glass of liquor. I stood up, went over to the mini bar, and poured myself some from the expensive bottle of Italian Jasmine had given me on my birthday. I downed the content at once. It tasted good, and I carried it with me to the couch, glass after glass, until I was drunk. Staggering my way to the bedroom was harder than stitching up a patient, but I made it to the bed. I lay there while the room took a non-stopping spiral turn. I tried grabbing onto something, but typical of Jasmine's neat freak style, the bed was free of anything of the sort. I reached farther and felt Steele's coldness against my fingers. I tapped onto it and the screen came alive. The reflection of the light from it filled the room. Laptop, I mumbled in my drunken state and tried to close it, but something caught my attention. Some of me still wished I had left the laptop alone and just slept off my drowsiness, but curiosity always kills the cat. I pulled the laptop closer and held it on my lap while I rested my bag against the wall, my eyes taking in the content of what I was reading. It was an email text between my wife and a guy. The oddity of this single inbox got me alert immediately. I flipped the screen and read another of this odd text, and before I could stop myself, I consumed the whole conversation that had been going on as far back as October the previous year. I was covered in profuse sweats, skimming the high-tension sex chat my so-called good wife was indulging in with a dude whose real identity had been hidden off with just him. Who was him? Where and when had they met? And what is their relationship? Is my wife really cheating on me? And many more questions kept poking at me all at once, but I had no answers. I closed the conversation tab and the laptop, standing up. I felt nauseated, but showed no sign of tipsiness anymore. I went to the bathroom and threw up over and over till I could feel my insides hurting. I rinsed out my mouth and walked back to bed. I laid in it, incapable of sleep, though I was putting up a fierce inner fight in favor of Jasmine's fidelity. My heart was broken because I never imagined my marriage was ever coming to this. Then I got a memory jog. I suddenly remembered how something like this had happened some time ago, and I had waved it aside. I had just finished my ward checking that morning and was on my way to my office when our mailbox officer arrived, and I took the mail from him, saving him the extra journey. There were the usual except for one. It was from an anonymous sender. I hesitated a while before opening it because I was skeptical about its content. I did eventually, and it was about my wife's infidelity. I frowned. Jasmine would never cheat on me. And since the content of the mail was just as scanty, I waved it aside and continued my day's business. I didn't even remember this letter or mention it to her until something similar happened, and it reminded me of it a week after. I was cleaning the garage on Saturday and Jasmine had gone to the theater for rehearsal when a journal slipped out of a pack. It looked oddly familiar as I had seen it before. It was Jasmine's and I decided to read its content out of curiosity. I know it was wrong to read other people's journals, but this was Jasmine's and we do not hide anything from each other. So I sat down and began flipping through. I smiled, reading her entries about me, our love life and marriage. I knew our bond was deep, but reading how she felt in this book made me more emotional about her. I was almost dropping it off to continue my chore when I saw an odd entry made a month before our first anniversary. 
It was a five-year plan about leaving a man. It was so detailed that I felt my heart pounding because of the description of this plan was related to our marriage. We were in our fourth year, and I got even more scared. Then I remembered the mail I received, and fresh perspiration covered me. Was Jasmine planning to leave me? Are these some jokes? I hid the journal between the other packs and continued my chore mindlessly. She found me here when she got back from rehearsal. I couldn't hide my feelings and decided to ask her about it. I could still hear her throaty laugh at my question. I will never cheat on you, Bradley. I'm an actress, and things like this are bound to happen. I could be seen with a colleague off work, and rumor mongers would take it as flings. I'm not cheating on you, okay? Get a grip and stop fidgeting. I know how much you detest that. Now, where are those vain thoughts coming from? She had asked me, and I felt sad, distrusting her. I told her about the journal entry I had found, and she waved it off as a movie plan she was looking forward to producing soon. I heaved a sigh of relief and apologized for doubting her. She agreed to go for therapy sessions if it would make me happier and bond better. Now I could see that though we were in therapy to recover from her cheating accusations, there they were, my wife and her lover, waxing poetic about their love and when I would be out of the house or at work so they could be together. Nothing hurts deeper. About 1 a.m., I heard the door open, and seconds later, Jasmine's soft, sonorous voice filled the house, announcing her arrival. She was humming an old jazz track she had forced me to like over the years. With Jasmine, the house was never quiet. She was blasting off songs from the stereo speakers, or humming a song, or on a call, laughing out loud. I knew my feelings were too raw to confront her, so I quickly adjusted on the bed and pretended to be asleep. She came into the room and to my side, bent over, and kissed my forehead. Sleep well, my love, she whispered, then left to the shower. I resented her act because of what I had just learned about her, and the doctor inside me knew it was time to dig deeper into my findings to develop a hypothesis. The days after this awful discovery, I ensured I was not around when she was, and I left home before she was up in the morning and delayed my shifts until she was away at rehearsal. I was practically avoiding my wife in the house, but she had no idea or did not mind it. The smile I always had on me when going home had long been buried. In its place was an awful frown and pain in my heart. The worst was when I discovered she had changed the password to her PC. Strange. I decided to ask just to get her reaction. Before work that morning, I had taken more time to prepare. She was up and stretching in bed by the time I was done. This is a good morning, obviously, darling. Been so long, we see, I heard her say behind me. Oh, my bad. Work's been super busy. How's rehearsal? I asked her, adjusting my tie. Hectic, but we should get our acts perfected before the show. You are attending the show, right? She replied. I nodded. Hey, babe, can I use your PC? I left mine back at the office and need to send a mail to my colleague. I said, turning on purpose to see her body language and reaction. She frowned. Okay, you know where it is, she shrugged. I had almost made it to the side table beside our bed when she suddenly jumped off and grabbed it. Sorry, she said, breaking into a charming smile. No worries, but what was that for? I asked. Nothing. I had the password changed because of some nosy-ass actors on set. Some don't know a thing about privacy, Jasmine laughed. She punched in the keywords, edging the screen from me. When she was done, she handed it to me. All yours. You could just tell me. Why stress? I hinted, watching her. Oh, true, I forgot. Use away. I've got to pee she said and dashed off to the bathroom before I could reply. I quickly went to her mailbox to get an update on their conversation, but she had all the chats cleared. There was no trace of the conversation between her and him I had read last week. I felt shaken, wondering if I had imagined the whole thing. I wished I had forwarded the messages to myself, and this would have been my proof. Nothing was inside the junk box, too. Disappointedly, I closed the page and dropped the laptop. Bye, hon. I have to go, I said, leaving for work. Have you a good day, my love? Jasmine's voice echoed after me, but my mind was too broken to bask in that mood. I was miserable throughout that day and the week that followed. Even if I had not seen the chats, changing her password and hiding it from me showed that she had something up her sleeve. Some of my work colleagues noticed the change in my demeanor and tried to cheer me up, but I was already a lost soul. Then, one opportunity presented itself for me to verify and perhaps catch Jasmine in the act. It was on a Friday morning, she had woken up earlier than usual, and it was hard to avoid her. 
She informed me they had a last minute rehearsal since their show was just a few days away and she would be coming home late. She was meeting up with an old friend in town. I frowned at that because the nature of her job makes it hard for me to remember or keep track of her friends. She must have seen my expression because she took the time to explain who this friend was. Apparently, she had been the best lady at our wedding. She was a bit disappointed in me for not remembering, and I had to apologize for it, and we left for work together. I got to work and checked my appointments for the day, and I was going to be busy on a patient at the time she had told me she would be seeing her friend, so I did what any betrayed husband would do. I switched with another colleague so I could be free to play detective. It's super brave to rush into a relationship so soon after one ends and without knowing someone entirely. As time goes on, their life unfolds before us and we get to know more about this stranger that totally entrapped us. Sometimes what we think is love is actually lust, a shiny new thing. Sometimes this helps us feel superhuman and feeling things we swear we haven't felt before. I feel like a lot of times this is because our rose-colored glasses fixate on physical beauty. Sometimes these rose-colored glasses make it impossible to see the truth. At the same time, not being able to have children together can really put strain on a marriage. I hope for your sake, OP, that I don't read on to find out that she actually cheated on you. Chapter 2 At exactly 9 p.m., I signed off work and drove off to a tech shop to get binoculars, then headed off to my wife's rehearsal theater downtown. I arrived a little earlier than the closing time, which was alright. I parked far away so she wouldn't notice my car or sense my presence. Once I was well positioned, I brought out the binoculars and focused on the hall's entrance. All her group members filed out in twos and threes, yet I didn't see Jasmine. What if she never made it to rehearsal, but had been with him all this time? This question crept into my head, messing with my sanity as I sat there waiting and watching. When it was obvious the hall was empty and the concierges were locking up, I jumped out of the car and ran towards the hall. The concierge gave me an awkward glance watching me, but I was not bothered about him. I made my way into the hall, searching the various rooms for my Jasmine, to no avail. She was not here, and I had been fooled all these times while she had been coming for training. Dejectedly, I turned to go to the staircase, but my nostril picked up a familiar scent, and then her steps approached my direction. Sorry, Marianne. I had to do something. I will be at the dinner soon, I heard her familiar voice say, and then the phone clicked. I quickly ran under the stairs until I heard her walk off the stairway before coming out of my hideout. My heart was pounding so fast that I had almost run into her, and she would have gotten a hint that I was tailing her. When I got out of the hall, she was several feet away from me, and getting into the car would make me lose track of her, so I followed behind her, not directly, but focused on her. Together, we walked down the cold street. I kept switching to avoid being made out, and eventually, she stopped at a dinner and walked in. She sat close to the window, which was to my advantage. I took my position close by, waiting for him to show up. I wanted to catch who had made my Jasmine betray our marriage vows. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes passed, yet there was no sign of him. I felt weak and sad. What if I had been made and he had gone back? But when I looked at Jasmine, she was getting just as impatient as I was and was not leaving. He was still coming, so I waited. At 10.30 p.m., when I was just giving up and going home, a car drove in, and I got alert again. This was him. I was angry, yet I kept my cool. But this feeling was short-lived. Instead of the man I had hoped to catch, it was a lady whose face I recognized immediately. It was Mary Ann. I felt sad in the stomach. Jasmine had not lied about her meeting, but I had suspected her wrongly. I waited until they had greeted me and seated me before leaving for the theater to get my car. I still didn't understand why I was sad as I drove home when I had not caught my wife cheating. I wanted to catch her with her lover so bad that I felt grumpy and more resentful towards her. Every night she lay close to me. I could feel the distance in our marriage. She suddenly was no longer the woman I had married years ago. She was different. This isn't Jasmine. She was a total stranger I didn't recognize. Or was this whom she was all along, merely putting on the axe for my sake? I was carried away during my surgery appointment and had to leave it to my assisting surgeon to finish up. Clearly, I was incapable of working on anyone if I wasn't ready to lose my license or go to jail. I made an impromptu note about my health and dropped it with a department head. She was sympathetic and allowed it because it was the first of its kind in 10 years. I drove home in a devastated state, collapsed on the sofa, and wailed like a child. Of course, Jasmine was not home, so I felt free to indulge myself in this pity party. I jumped. Startled when my phone rang, and it was David calling. 
We had merely stayed friends over the years, mainly through texts because of Jasmine. Not anymore, obviously. I wiped the tears off my face and managed to smile before answering the call. I couldn't fool him. He saw through my excuses when he asked why my voice was odd. I faked a cough to cushion my cold lies, but he was not buying it. Then he dropped the news. He was in town, having just been offered a case here. I suddenly felt good. Though David stayed far away whenever he was around, we always hang out and there is never a dull moment with him. Without hesitating, I told him I was also on a three-day leave from work and we made plans to see. This arrangement gave me something to look forward to aside from spying on my wife. I got off the sofa and went inside to get a cold shower. I kept eyeing the laptop on the bed while I changed into my PJs, but I left it. Blocking out any negative thoughts was at the top of my list until I saw and talked to David. He was always charming with women and knew how to play the detective role better than any guy I knew. I went into the kitchen, heated up my meal, and ate silently. Jasmine called to tell me she was sleeping over at the theater, but I didn't mind. I was relieved I was not going to hide from her anyway. I went into the mini bar, got myself a bottle, and drank through the night until I dropped off on the couch and slept. The second I got to the lounge, David saw it, the pain I was doing in an awful job hiding. What the hell is eating you up? He asked as we shook hands. It is Jasmine. I think my marriage is over. I spilled to the one person I could confide in. The look on his face was just as awestruck as I had expected. I filled him in the details of what I had noticed about the journal I found and the anonymous tip I got too. Then my voice dropped when I told him about my futile effort to get evidence against her. David sat across from me, nodding to my words, but he had nothing to say. Jasmine was the last person ever to think she would cheat on me. She had that effect on me after all. Sure the messages you read were no mind tricks? He asked me. I shook my head, more to myself than him. I knew in my gut that Jasmine was having an affair and I needed hard proof to confront her. David did his best to cheer me up and distract my bleeding mind and he almost succeeded in counting the number of bottles lying on our table. You need evidence, mate. I will help you get it and we all can deal with this. These were his parting words to me as he drove off. I stood there nodding sheepishly, but realized something I had denied all month. I was done with the pity party of mourning an infidel. Jasmine becomes more distant than usual and kept hanging the excuse on the show, which was just two days to go. I hatched my plan in silence, communicating my moves with David only. This gave me a purpose, something to look forward to. I was no longer sad. David and his friends would pick me up in the evenings to hang out. I ensured I was sharing these details with Jasmine setting her free intentionally. Then, the great show day came. David had agreed to come, and Jasmine was thrilled about this. She hugged us when we arrived at the theater before disappearing off to her group. We scouted the members for clues, any unnecessary hugs, smooches, or lingering looks for hours. If her lover was here, he was just as good an actor as my wife was, with no slip-ups. Soon, the lights went out, the play began, and we left our detective role for the time being. The play was interesting and I laughed now and then. However, what was the first ray of hope in my quest to catch Jasmine was her appearance on the show. She was being extra, nothing to warrant such intense rehearsal. I smiled, mentally noting this fact. The show ended and we stood up to leave. I would have thought Jasmine was the lead act, David said, obviously unhappy she had barely made an appearance in the two hour long show. I tried to snicker my laugh, but it escaped me and I broke into a very long, loud laugh embarrassing myself from the faces gawking at me while I continued laughing. At first, David stopped in his track and touched my shoulder, watching me. Then he joined me in this crazy laugh. Others laughed too. Then as quickly as it started, I stopped. And so did David. It's okay. We will get to the end of this, he said. Jasmine breezed in on us, smiling brightly, but I was no longer falling for it. She told us we could leave without her since she had to do some post-play tasks with her crew. I felt more than relieved about this, and we left. I decided to give David a treat for the evening, and we went to an Italian restaurant. After we were done, I insisted on paying and handed my credit card to the waitress, and we continued chatting away. The waitress returned with a frown on her face. My card was maxed. I shook my head in protest. There was no way that was possible, and I just got my pay for the month barely 48 hours ago. The waitress tried multiple times to no avail. David paid eventually, and we left. I tried my card on the ATM stand across from the restaurant and found I had nothing in the account. Who else has access to this account? David asked. The answer is there without saying it. 
Jasmine and I have run a joint account since we got married, and I was not one interested in alerts and all, so she had full access to everything. Damn! I yelled. We better act fast, or you are doomed, David said, shaking his head at me. Had I fallen for a con artist? I got home but had no idea how I did because I was deep in thought. Too depressed at the turn my once so perfect life was taking, I sat down on the porch next to David, lost in thought. I was planning how to make sense of all these when David tapped me and handed me a stick of cigarettes. I wanted to decline, knowing how much I preach and advise against it as a doctor, but David held it in front of me long enough to make me change my mind, and I took it reluctantly from him. My nostrils caught the pungent and spicy curling black smell, and I frowned, looking at David, who just smiled and handed me a lighter. I put it on my lips, and it felt odd, but my life was way past perfect or sane. I drew in the smoke. It felt richer, and its exotic rawness, and I swallowed quickly and did my best not to cough like I had always seen and heard but was unable to. I started to cough, and David patted my back slowly. Then I suddenly felt light on my feet for over a minute, and suddenly experienced the incredible feeling of being safe and relaxed. A bit silly and less worried. We didn't say anything, but just smoked silently until I was ready to sleep. David left, and I went in. I went to the wine bar and searched frantically for something to drink, but almost all the bottles were empty since I had been drinking more than I ever had in years. Feeling anger building inside me for not getting it, I shifted the glasses and a med bottle dropped. I hissed and continued my search. The bottle rolled over, stopping at my foot. So I picked it up, put it back on the shelf when I saw the inscription. I recognized it at once. This was a prescription for birth control. What the heck? I yelled wondering why we had this bottle in the house when we had been trying hard to get pregnant and why Jasmine was hiding it here. I suddenly felt nauseated and rushed to the bathroom with the bottle in my hand. I must have passed out after throwing up because it was the last thing I remembered for the night. I woke up to the stench of my vomit the next morning and I quickly cleaned up after myself until the bathroom was sparkling clean again. I removed my soiled clothes and took a long shower. I dried my body and felt relieved. I came out of it to bump into Jasmine. She was angry at me, just like I was at her. We need to talk. We should talk. We both said, and I shrugged. You go ahead. Fine. Where did all the wines go? You barely drink, love, and now all the bottles in the bar are empty. You as a doctor know how much this stuff damages the kidney. She shot accusing eyes at me. For a minute, I wondered if she was asking because she cared about my health or because I had found her pills. Say something. Should I be worried about you and David? He's some bad influence on you. He shows up and the wine bar is empty, she yelled. No, David has nothing to do with this, I said. Then what is the issue? Why are you drinking so heavily? She said, coming closer. And to think I found you lying lifeless on the floor when I got in was scary. You should quit drinking. Okay, I replied. Something is wrong, right? Your eyes, the way you look at me, what is wrong? Trouble at work? She asked. I wanted to laugh, wondering how I had never seen the act she put up around me. Two weeks ago, I would have fallen for this act, mistaking it for love and care, but I was just her paycheck to an adulterous life. How about you talk about what you were going to say earlier? She added when I didn't respond. Why have you been using contraceptive? Jasmine, I thought we were on the same page about kids, I busted out. Oh, she said and stepped away from me. Oh, what? Why are you using it? We aren't even having sex. And I stopped before I could shoot myself in the leg. I can't have a baby now, love. This is the apex of my career. A bulging stomach now would ruin everything. I can't afford to raise a baby yet. We talked about this, right? No, we didn't. We didn't. And using pills is a one-sided decision you made. Enough. It is my body, and I can decide what I want to do with it. She screamed at me. Her eyes took a shade I had never seen before. Okay, and why is our card maxed out? I asked, my eyes fixed on her. I saw her panic like she was surprised I had discovered that, and it was gone. I forgot to tell you. Tell me what? I asked. I am producing a movie in Hawaii, and the fee is so heavy, I just borrowed from us. I will refund every dime the second I have the movie in cinemas. She chatted excitedly. I see. When is this movie production starting? I asked. Next, tomorrow, she said. Why so fast? You just finished one only yesterday, I frowned. 
Well, like I said, this is the climax of the season. We have to start now to finish quickly and max the viewer's interest, she explained. Jasmine was all I could say. I turned back to the bathroom and took a crap. Jasmine packed her bag the next day and was ready to leave for Hawaii. I saw the laptop covered with the pillow and held my breath, watching as Jasmine went back and forth, picking this and that. I used the duvet to conceal it more, and I felt so happy when she left without remembering it. This was fate smiling down on me. I waited until her flight had left before calling David to tell him about the laptop. He was thrilled, just like I was. This meant we could get evidence to use. To my dismay, she had changed her password, and all our attempts to unlock the laptop were futile. I was angry, feeling we were close to her dirty secret and couldn't do anything about it. Then David suggested we call an IT expert to hack her laptop. This I was not in support of. It was one thing to go through her laptop and another thing to have a total stranger invade her privacy. I asked David for a little more time to think about this, and he hung up and left for work. I kept pacing my office, wondering if infringing on Jasmine's privacy was the subtle way to go at this. I felt terrible about this, but she had been doing more to my detriment for a while now, so I made up my mind, dialed David, and gave him the go-ahead to his suggestion. I felt relieved after this, and was more clear-headed to do the rest of my shifts. I got anxious as my closing hours got closer, however. David picked me up after work and went to the tech shop. The guys had hacked the laptop, and I carried it home with shaky hands. Once in the house, I opened it with David. There was nothing to hide about these whole affairs since he will be my lawyer anyway. I didn't see the old chats even in the archive, but we got something to make David believe me. New chats from him and the hotel reservations she had made with our account. Hawaii, the same place she had told me, was the location for her new movie. I sighed disgustedly at how much of a fool I had been all these years. My goodness, I exclaimed, shaking my head as we read through the disgusting chats between my wife and her lover. Apparently, they had gone on their sexual rendezvous. Are these enough to file a suit? I asked Dave. Not substantial enough. How about we get a PI to tailor? You can't keep running off work to stalk her. People's lives depend on you, right? Dave had suggested. At this point, I was no longer bothering about right and wrong. Hacking the laptop was the first step away from normal, and I had crossed that already, so I nodded. Do you think I'm a fool? I asked Dave. You fell in love just like everyone else. It is just sad it had to be Jasmine treating you this way. She is at a loss anyways, David said. By now, it is all gone. I will fight this case with the last drop of blood inside of me. No cheating partner should be spared. I promise to see the end of this, I said between clenched fists. I am in this with you all the way, David assured me. I will forward these messages to myself to keep this evidence, to pad up our case, he added, and I nodded again, my tongue too heavy to say anything. I feel like there's no real evidence that she's actually cheating on you at this point, OP. It just seems circumstantial. Or perhaps I'm missing something? I mean, she is an actress after all. I don't want to say that you might be jumping the gun, but at this point, it just seems like you may be overreacting a little bit. I feel like confronting your wife and attempting an open and honest conversation about how you're feeling and how you're perceiving things might have saved you some trouble in this case, OP, especially if it was affecting your career. Although it wasn't cool of her to not consult you before maxing out the card, I'm not sure the signs are really pointing to cheating. That all being said, I can understand how you would feel this way and jump to the conclusion given your previous relationships. Chapter 3 I visited my account manager after work one evening and gave him strict warnings not to release any money from my work account to the joint account anymore and told him every deduction has to go through me first. He asked my reason for this, and I told him I just wanted to be more frugal and intentional about my spending. He was pleased with my decision and made necessary arrangements, all these without Jasmine's suspicion. I went about my life without giving anything away anymore. Instead of losing focus or being distracted, I was more active. I was letting go of my feelings and doing my best to stay unbothered while the PI Dave employed filled me in with the details of my wife's gory cheating life in Hawaii. Every detail made it hard for me to keep up with the act but I had to do it for my sake. Then, one evening, while I was hanging out with David, he showed me the recent pictures the PI had sent. This one got a better view of her lover, and I stared back at the picture for a long time, trying to place why the face looked oddly familiar. After a fruitless brain search, I gave up and shook my head while discussing our actions. The blurry angle of the picture kept popping up in my head all evening and even the next morning. I had seen that face before, and in proximity too. It felt very familiar. I told the PI about this, 
and he agreed to get a better angle later that day. As promised, more pictures came in just before my shift ended. I nearly dropped my phone when I finally recollected where I had seen that face. I snatched the phone from my desk and called David. I know him. It is him, I said. What? David said. The guy from five years ago. Her date. The night I saw her. I think this is more like a planned swindle case, I told him. Interesting. Now I think you have a case. Now we have a case, dear friend. What have you gotten involved with? David said excitedly. Not really. Not yet. I have to see it for myself. Hold on for a few more days. She's coming back to town tomorrow. I'll watch her till the weekend. And if no slips, then we serve her lying butt. Okay then, I heard Dave say before he dropped the call. I carried the wedding frame on my desk and threw it against the wall. It smashed into a million pieces, just like my heart. I had been played for a fool. My blood was boiling inside me, but I was not one to resort to violence. I would handle this as diplomatically as possible. They wouldn't see me coming until it was too late. I went to pick up Jasmine at the airport when she called the next day. If she was a good actress, then I was a better one. I went to the airport with flowers in hand. I welcomed her, playing the perfect husband she had known perfectly. She was excited to see me in a better mood, and I smiled throughout our ride while she filled me with different cooked up stories about the Hawaii movie. I would give her occasional glances to see if she would twitch an eyelid or bite a lip, something she does when uncomfortable. But no, my wife was the perfect actress after all. Then we got home, and she said something. I had no idea what she was referring to. We are good now. I am back home. Yes, you are, my love. Welcome home, I responded, stepping out of the car. She hugged me when she got out of the car. I merely held her against me for a brief second and let go. I could smell the reek of infidelity on her, which irked me. She stayed more at home after this Hawaii travel and was more available in the house. She was not running off to rehearsals or booking last minute flights like before. So much, I had to ask if all was well with her supposed movie out of curiosity. She just smiled and said it was in view. She told me she had something big cooking, and I knew she planned to get rid of me. Suddenly, I remember the journal plan she had also written down. Why are you smiling? She asked. I just cannot wait to see how it comes out. Me too. Cheers. She winked at me, and I smiled back. The PI didn't get any updates the week that followed her arrival, and I became apprehensive because I needed to have the case started. Pretending to still be in love was harder than working on a patient. It was draining, and I hated it. She was becoming disgusting to live with, and she would not go out as often as always to give me time to be sane when David asked about the progress of our investigation. I told him how abruptly her acts had become and had been home since then. Then I got more anxious and started my mind throbbing. Had she realized we were onto her and was hiding more now? What if she had made me out and was holding back? Was this another phase of her plan to keep me on close watch? These questions got me busy, but I didn't let them weigh me down. I was almost calling the PI surveillance services off after three weeks of no activities on their end when my wandering eyes found their way to my calendar and the dates I had marked for the year. Jasmine's birthday was a week away. Dang! I felt giddy and hopeful again, knowing she and her lover would have something planned out for the big day. No wonder she had been keeping things on a low lately. She was preparing, as she said, but I was going to do just that too. I called the PI and informed him to be more observant since we would get the birthday preparation started. I got home that evening to the warm aroma of lamb stew, one of my favorites meal, and Jasmine welcomed me home full of smiles. I went to shower and after this sat to eat the food. I was a bit scared to eat since I had no idea what she was up to, so I hesitated to eat until she had eaten some of hers. Halfway through the meal, I asked about her plans for the coming birthday and she informed me she was not in the mood for any big celebrations that would make her throw money around with her big movie project. I insisted she invite all of our friends and make a sweet event of her day. Typical of Jasmine, she agreed, and we ate in silence. After she had taken dessert, she came by my side and held my hands. Thank you for all that you do, honey. You are such a good man, she blurted out suddenly, staring at me. I nodded at her and said nothing. Whatever was going through her mind was no business of mine. I just wanted out of the lies in the best way possible. After the desserts, we went to bed. She rolled over to my side and hugged me. I was going to shrug off her hands, but held the urge in. I was not going to blow up my plans, so I pretended to be fast asleep instead. She tried to snuggle her way to wake me up, but I was determined not to touch her. The image of another man on her was more than nauseating for me, 
and I couldn't get it off my mind. I have never been able to see past that since I found out. She gave up eventually and went to bed too. As soon as I heard her snoring softly, I knew she was sleeping. I let out my breath and pulled farther away from her. I didn't sleep till morning. I was finding the best way to make her birthday the mind-blowing event for her. After that day, we would have no reason to be this close in bed together anymore. I would not be pretending anymore. I would be free once again to treat a cheating wife how she ought to be treated, kept miles away and never together. David came by my office a day before the big day and we made last minute plans about things we had mapped out. He wouldn't dare show up, will he? I asked him. He might. There's a high chance he would and it is a good thing we recognize his butt. He shows up, we get to kick his act. Legally, I mean, David replied. I picked up some drinks for the party and bar refill on my way home, which was the task I had agreed to from the long list she had drawn. I had also agreed to be in charge of the graphics and media, and she had unsuspectingly agreed to it. I was not looking forward to this party because it would be the official declaration of the end of my marriage, but it was inevitable. Better to be heard from me first than have Jasmine ruin the reputation I had worked hard to build later. When I got home, Jasmine had converted the living room to a ballroom hall. She had more chandeliers and in some interior decor that gave the room a fancy touch. She was standing in the middle of it, beaming radiantly. She turned towards me when she heard me enter and clapped both hands tightly under her chin. Do you like it? She asked, blinking her long eyelashes at me as usual. I love it. Well done, girl, I said dryly, releasing the knot on my tie. Oh, thank you. Marianne and I did it all day, but the idea was all mine, she said, breaking into a mock bow. Nice. Where is she? I asked. In the guest room. I hope you do not mind, she said. Oh, not at all. I will go say hi to her later. She must be tired out, I said. Oh, no. You do not want to get on her cuss side for ruining her beauty sleep. She gets cranky when you wake her up, Jasmine cut in quickly. I frowned at her, then shrugged my shoulders. I will see her tomorrow, then. Happy birthday in advance, my love, I said, and walked closer to her. I had doubted her once about Marianne and didn't want to do it again, so I let it rest and gave her a peck on the forehead because I couldn't kiss her on the lips anymore. She tried to hold me longer, but I sighed, feigning tired and headed each, so I was able to pull away. Dinner will be on the table after you have showered, okay? Now off you go, you sweaty, charming man. Jasmine shooed me off, and I felt nothing weird. The second we pulled the duvet over us, her phone started to ring. She would silence it, and it would ring again. It went on and off for over 10 minutes, and when I couldn't take it any longer, I whispered to her, Shouldn't you answer it? It could be urgent. Okay, I will step out so you can sleep, Jasmine said. She slipped out of the bed and walked out of the room. Then I heard her converse in a hushed tone. Then a door opened and closed. I waited for some minutes, but Jasmine didn't come back, so I sat up. I heard a door open, and Jasmine's steps came closer, so I lay down quickly. She came to the room, peeped at me, and called my name. I just lay down there and pretended to be sleeping. Then she left the room. I followed after keeping a careful distance, but she didn't even look back. As I said, she was getting careless. She walked to the guest room, and I was going to stop following, thinking she was just going over to see Marianne. But the door opened as we neared it, and a man emerged from the shadows. He had his back on me, and I could not see his face, but I could tell it was the same man I had seen in the pictures. He had brown hair and chiseled shoulders, and I could tell he was taller than me seeing how she tiptoed up to him, and he pulled her close. They started kissing. Jasmine devoured his kisses hungrily, surrendering herself to him. Seeing another man's arms around my wife was strange and awful. I knew I should hide, but I didn't. I tiptoed back to the room and got my phone. If my wife had a man in our home, this was the perfect time to get evidence tenderable in court. By the time I made it back to my spot behind the bar, they were still caressing each other's bodies at the door and I angled my camera with shaky hands after I had put it on flight mode to prevent any interruption or ruin my chances. I felt I was exposed and in plain sight. If Jasmine turned around, she would surely see me, but I couldn't move. I was transfixed with hatred. Eventually, they stopped kissing for a few seconds and walked into the room, arm in arm. I followed. It was disorienting. From behind, from a distance, the man did not look dissimilar to me. For a few seconds, I had confused. How could she bring him to my house? Jasmine led the man toward the room upstairs. He followed her into it, and they closed the door. I felt the sick feeling of dread inside me as my breathing was thick, slow, and heavy. 
Every part of my body told me to leave, go, run, and run away, but I didn't. I couldn't follow them into the room. I tiptoed out of my hiding spot and walked over to the bedroom window, and to my relief, it was opened, giving me the best view of everything in the room. I placed the phone in a position to get a clearer view than me and hidden too. Then I stopped for a few minutes to get my hands from shaking with disgust and bent on all four as I listened. I heard a rustling in the bedstand, but it could have been the AC. Then I heard something that made my blood boil even more. The unmistakable, low guttural sound I recognized at once. It was Jasmine moaning. I tried to get closer, but the shock of seeing another man screwing my wife made it impossible for me to move my legs. I stood there in the dim light, breathing in the musty smell of perspiration. I listened to Jasmine moaning as he screwed her. He grunted like an animal. I burned with fresh hatred for Jasmine and was more determined to make her pay for her infidelity. None of my ex-girlfriends had done half of this, and I had cut communications with them. She must be a big fool letting this man ruin our beautiful family, but this was over months ago. If this man loved her half as much as I did, then it was her loss, but I doubted it. Not the way I did. He was just using her, using her body. There was no way he cared for her as I used to. Jasmine's moans grew louder, suddenly interrupting my thoughts, and I recognized the groans she made as she climaxed. Then there was silence interrupted by a muffled giggle I knew so well. I could hear the snapping of the bedstand as they crawled out of it. Go before I change my mind, the man said, and Jasmine giggled before leaving the room. I watched her tiptoe back to our room. I waited for a few moments, then I snapped out of my shocking state I was in. When I emerged from my hideout, my eyes were half blind with tears. I wiped them away with my palms clenched into a fist. I lurched off, going nowhere. I got the phone and dropped it in my pocket. Then I kept walking around like some insane person back to our bedroom. Jasmine slept when I got in like she had never left the bed. If I was skeptical about my decision before, I wasn't anymore. I was done with this woman for good. It was well into the afternoon when I woke up again. I had slept so long because of the pills I had popped when I couldn't sleep. The first thing I did after discovering I was alone in bed was to get my phone. I was relieved to feel it inside my pajamas pocket. I pulled it out and removed it from the flight mode it had been in all night, and voicemails from David came in. He had needed some details about the party and more messages from a few others who were not my priority at the moment. I sat up and sent the recorded clip to David. He called me almost immediately. How and where did this come from? He asked. My own house, right under my nose. Can you believe that? I said, shaking my head. This is crazy. What the heck? David exclaimed. Yes. Now I have evidence, right? And yes, it is tonight. I cannot wait any further, I said, and hung up the call before any other words. I peeked out of our window and saw some of Jasmine's drama group hanging around. I didn't invite any friends over except for David and the PI, and I felt even more relieved that I hadn't gone through the stress. I avoided Jasmine throughout the day until it was time to dress up for the evening party. I wore a different suit in place of the matching one she had picked, and this got her curious. Why not this? Jasmine asked, pointing to the one she had handpicked in the closet. I want you to stand out and not steal the shine. It is your party after all. I laughed icily. Nice thought, but that would have been better. But this one is great too. Perfect color for those charming eyes I fell for, she said with a flirty wink gave me a peek and left the room. The party had kicked off when I stepped out into the hall. I was shocked to see the many guests she had over, and I only had David and all the 50 heads peering at me. The rest were our mutual friends and mostly Jasmine's acquaintances. And there he is, the man of my dreams, Jasmine exclaimed, bringing their attention to me. I waved shyly and made my way to her side. I hugged her and whispered into her ears, I have a gift for you. It will come in before the end of the party. She laughed, and the guests clapped. I lowered it around her while she introduced her friends to me. I didn't see her lover or Marianne, which made me curious. Where's Marianne? I asked her, looking around. Oh, she left. Promise to be back before we end things or not. She's tired, I guess, she said between wine sips. Oh, I replied. Marianne was never even here. It was all her lies and love doing it while I was away and didn't even have the decency to go after I got back. I sighed. Yes, she said. A friend walked up to her, and I excused myself to go over to meet David. Well, David frowned. Let's do it. Is he ready? I asked David. Ready to push the button at your call, David said. Then let him do it in five minutes. Noted, David said. 
I got called up to read my wishes for her, and I did. I read her a note I had scribbled out of a web search, and they listened when it was time to show her my gift. I told her it was in a clip, and they should sit to enjoy my favorite memories of my beautiful wife and gave David the cue. The clip I had taken of my wife and her lover hours ago filled the projected screen, and I stood there watching her expression. It was blank and cold, very unreadable. Her friends were unmoved by the disgruntled words being hauled at me. I was just standing there, a faithful man who had caught his wife cheating. When she couldn't take it anymore, she jumped out of her seat and raced inside the house. I didn't follow. The guests became suddenly shy and began to file out of the room. In 10 minutes, the once bubbly party was gone, and in its place was a decorated room with no one but myself. Even David had left. I didn't notice. I found Jasmine sitting on the bed with her palm covering her face. She lifted her head when she heard me and said, Since when have you known? I laughed at how ridiculous the question was. I expected her to argue with me that I was mistaken, but there she was, asking the ridiculous question. Answer me, she yelled. Such a shame. Why are you yelling at me? You stoop so low bringing him to my house? I replied. Our house. It is mine as well, Jasmine cut in. I laughed again. How ridiculous. I must have struck you as a fool all these years. So much you couldn't even respect me. She gave me a shrug. I guess you are. Then see you in court. Since I am a fool, you do not have anything to fear but alimony. What? Yes. And pending the time we go our ways, I want you out of my bedroom. I should have gone off to the guest room, but you have it stamped for your lewd act. So get on with it, I told her. She eyed me for some second, stood up, and walked to the closet. I watched without interest as she hurriedly stuffed some wares into a duffel bag. I will whoop your butt blue and black in court for this. You may want to consider the options, she said breathlessly. I did not respond to any of her rants. I had enough of it anyway. When she was done, she walked out of the room without another word. This was the last time I saw Jasmine before the court proceedings began a few weeks later. With the evidence I had against Jasmine, the proceedings had been going in my favor, and I was looking forward to a clean verdict. But Jasmine boycotted me after one of such hearings, after David had left. I felt a pang of pain, seeing how much she had changed since we last saw her. She had more bags under her eyes and dropped some pounds, too. I didn't feel any sorry for her because she had done this to herself. I offered her the world, and she threw it back at me. She grabbed my wrist and held on tightly. What is this about? I'm not saying a word without my lawyer, I said as I tried to get my arm from her grip. I am very sorry, Brad. I should never have agreed to cheat on you. I am sorry. Please. She cried, the tears slipping into my palm. I didn't say anything or give off any emotion. I fell in love with you, but had to do this dirty bidding when he tried blackmailing me with our past. For how long? From the look of what I saw, you were not being coerced into anything. Why make excuses? Are you suddenly feeling guilty or scared of going to jail? I asked. The Hawaii trip was supposed to be the end of everything. He took our money, and I wanted to get rid of him. Why I did it, she whispered. No, enough with the lies. Hawaii was before your party, I cut in. He suddenly showed up and was ready to make a ruse just before you arrived. I had no option, Brad. Believe me. Let go of my arm. You lie without blinking. Gosh, you disgust me. I jerked my arm off her and reached for the door. What she said next got me to stop. You will not want your child raised between bars. I am pregnant, and it is yours, I heard her say, and I went numb to the bone. I am carrying your child, Brad. He found out and threw me out. Please. I turned to look at her in the eyes. She was staring back at me. Mine? I asked, my voice shaky and cold. Yes. We could go for a medical checkup if you do not believe it, she told me. No way. We have not had sex in weeks. Enough of this bickering. Bye. I said and got into the car, driving off. I thought I had gotten to the end of Jasmine in my life, and now she is up with another drama. A part of me wanted to believe she was lying, and another was excited to know I was having a child, but I hated it had to be Jasmine. Then I shrugged off the feeling. I was not going to be served by her lies anymore. This had just gotten more complicated if she was pregnant with my child. I had to call Dave, and we agreed to meet up. Oh dear, there's the evidence. I can't believe she'd do that in your home while you're home. That's ballsy and stupid. I'm so sorry, OP. That's not easy, especially given your history. You were right all around. The gut feeling is never wrong. And for her to then blame it all on him, 
It seems right that she wouldn't take responsibility for her own actions. I really hope that she's not actually pregnant and is just saying that to hurt you or to trick you into staying. This could definitely complicate things more than they already are. Chapter 4 The first question Dave asked me when I explained things to him was to be sure Jasmine was not carrying my child as she had claimed. Though I was quite convinced initially that I was not the father, I suddenly developed cold feet when I remembered we had sex a week before the cheating issue started. Oh my god, I exclaimed, my eyes almost ogling out of their sockets. You did what? Dave banged the desk angrily. This will no doubt draw things back a great deal, but we can always verify the DNA way before it is born, he said. We can do that, I know, but I'm sure Jasmine will not agree to it. She would drag this on until she delivers it, I said. Then you just got a case sitting dock till then, Dave frowned at me. I sat there in silence, hating on Jasmine. This could be another trick in her bag. She wanted me to nurse her, even though she might be carrying her ex's child. I was once again caught in between her drama, and the only thing I could do was hope she agreed to a DNA report. Will you throw the case away if it's yours? I gave him the answer straight up. No. I will plead for the child's custody if I can, then support the kid till death. I am done and over with Jasmine. Trust me. Now I get your stand. Keep your eyes open and ears searching for information. Anything to prove you are not avoiding the child's responsibility because her lawyers will use that line in court, he said. Thanks for the heads up, Dave, I said and left. Just as David had hinted to me, the next court hearing had Jasmine and her lawyer arguing that I was merely escaping the child's support by denying the pregnancy. I was equipped, thanks to my lawyer, and we were granted DNA permission, but it was momentarily. The second the verdict came out of the judge's mouth, Jasmine fainted and was rushed to the hospital. I stayed away on Dave's advice, and he went to check on her formally because of the case. In the end, the DNA report was overruled based on the doctor's report about how risky it was for a fetus and the mother. I insisted I couldn't have the case dragged until she birds the child, and we closed the case with a clause, to be reopened after the baby's delivery. I felt this relief like a shackle had been broken off of my feet. I thanked Dave and paid his retainer fee, and went home. The next day, I had the locks changed in case Jasmine had other plans to come over to the house while I was away. If I had not bought the house and its proximity to work, I would have sold it off right away to prevent any form of contact and then there was the what if baby factor lurking in my mind too. When I informed Dave of this, he was pleased I was taking real steps in denying Jasmine access to me, which was good for the case and my mental health. He proceeded to have me bug the house and install CCTV in and around for additional safety precautions. This seemed extreme to me, but I gave in to the advice eventually since it was better safe than sorry. I contracted the installation to a good tech firm. Three days after, the house was on 24-hour daily surveillance. I barely checked out anything, but it was recording and saving. When we need anything, it will come in handy. Two weeks after this, I was at work when a number called me repeatedly and then left a voicemail for a call back when I'm available. I was curious about who the caller was, merely assuming it was Jasmine was not right, so I called back. I was surprised to hear from Mary Ann. Most of Jasmine's friends had stopped reaching out to me since the party clip on her last birthday. I was ready to listen to her rant about how awful I was, but she did nothing of the sort. After the pleasantries, Marianne informed me she needed to see me about something that would be useful regarding the case. It was an obvious bait, one I should have turned down, but I was also information craving. I wanted to know if Jasmine was truly pregnant or have her drop follow up a hint about it. So I agreed to see her the next day. I would be off duty and have enough time to drill her for information. She agreed and hung up. I didn't tell Dave about the visit because I didn't quite make out what it would be about anyway. Mary Ann showed up at the house at the scheduled time the next day and I showed her into the house. She seemed bothered about something. This I could tell from her body language because I'm a doctor. I was going to ask her about it when my phone started to ring. I had just got paged to a special emergency case at the hospital. They knew I was off work, but this was a case only I could handle. I was caught between chasing facts and saving a life. Eventually, the Hippocratic oath I had sworn got the better of me, and I rushed into the house to get dressed. I had to tell Marianne to come another day, but she declined, to say she was leaving town and would wait for me. I was skeptical about this, but remembered the cameras were watching. I left eventually. I was at the door of the hospital when I got a call. Another doctor had taken the call, and I could return home. I turned back and dropped home. 
a bit relieved I had not missed getting the information from Marianne. I was, however, shocked to see she had left already. I glanced at the gold wristwatch on me and calculated the time I had used in total. It was barely 20 minutes. This was odd for someone who had promised to wait for me regardless of time. I checked the rooms. Nothing had been messed up or looked out of place. I dialed Marianne's number, but she didn't pick up, and it went straight to voicemail after an hour. I left her messages to call me back or asked to explain why she had left in a hurry. I left another meetup since I was available. She returned none of it. What got me alarmed was when the number was suddenly disconnected. I felt this was something Dave had to hear about, so I called to inform him. He couldn't answer it because he was driving to a remote area on investigation but promised to come over to the house in the evening and we could discuss it better. I felt restless, trying to keep my mind busy. Had Marianne been there to fool me or snitch on Jasmine? Had Jasmine sent her over for a reason? Why had she left in a hurry? These questions were all I could think about until Dave showed up later that evening. After listening to what I had to say, his first question was, Did you check the CCTV recording? I stared at him, at how I had forgotten about it. You really are the best at your job, I explained, and we both went to the study where the recordings were and sat through the clips. I gave Dave the schedule, and we checked it. Marianne had made for the room the second I left. I could tell she had been told where to look because she headed straight to the closet. She peeped around for a while and climbed into the closet, holding a folder in her hand. Dave zoomed in to get a better idea of what was written on it, but it was a bit blurry, and he took a snap of it. Did you recognize that? He asked me. No, that side of the closet is for Jasmine's, and we don't infringe, I replied, wishing I had. Then we focused our eyes back on the screen. Something had dropped from the folder, but Marianne was too much in a rush to pick it up. She arranged the stool where she had gotten it and dashed out. We switched to the exterior camera. A van had come to pick her up, and we wrote down the plate number. We can follow this up. Dave said, sniffing a yawn. He was tired and I felt bad using him, so I suggested he sleep over and have dinner with me so he could rest better since it was too late. Dave agreed and we ate dinner. After dinner, while we sat through the hot chocolate cake I had ordered for us to use as dessert, David asked if I knew where Marianne stays, and I went blank. In all the years I had known her with Jasmine, we had never talked about where Marianne stays nor visited. In fact, the meeting earlier was like the fourth time I had seen her in six years. Once while we were dating, when we got married, the day I sneaked up on her during my investigation, and that afternoon. And that was quite odd. Jasmine sees her every time, but not with me, and always away from the house. Don't you feel that is odd? Dave asked, airing my unspoken thoughts. I'm going to find out. I think she stays downtown. I scratched my head in doubt. I will ask the PI to look her up. Downtown is no place for you, doctor. Dave had teased me as he took a bite of the cake. True. Let me know when he finds her out. We need to be sure about what she took from my house and why. Sure, Dave said in between mouthfuls. We ate in silence afterward. I was busy putting up the puzzle with not much luck presently. Something was going on between Jasmine, Marianne, and her ex. And I could not wait to know why they were in such a messed up story together. While Dave and the PI worked extensively on the case, I focused my energy on saving lives at work. Some days it was easier to forget I was going through a sensitive time in my life between the busy work hours, but on days I was off work, it dawned on me and I would watch the CCTV clips to keep myself busy. During one of such pastime activities, I noticed something in the clips dating back to a week since Marianne's visit. A man in black overalls had been watching the house. He was dressed in complete black down to the sunglasses he would watch the house from the black van across the house for hours, then drive off. I zoomed in on the clip to help me see anything that would help me recognize this stalker, but he was perfect at disguising. He would leave when it got creepy for people on the street. I noted down the time he usually shows up at the house. He alternates it, but it was always while I was away. When I checked against my schedule, it felt creepier. He was always here at the house at the same time I got into the hospital. More like someone had given him my schedule. I decided to see for myself the next day by switching schedules with a colleague who was relieved because he had been looking for someone to switch with. I stayed in the door, putting out the lights, and dropped the curtains to give the stalker a hint I was out. I waited in vain all day, hoping he would come between the hours I had predicted based on his patterns, but he never showed up, and I knew right away he had help at my work because nobody else was aware I would be home aside from my colleagues. This spooked me because I had no idea who could be feeding the stalker my movement at work. 
I knew David was busy with the case he was working on, so I called the PI directly to meet up because we fixed a convenient time for us. I transferred the clips from the CCTV to a flash drive and left the house. Halfway through to the PI, I noticed the black van was following me. It felt uneasy to me and turned to be sure the car was actually on my trail. It followed and made no effort to stay careful and hidden. The driver was making sure I knew I was being followed, perhaps to get me shaken up. Since I realized this, I suddenly got confident and slowed the car down. The dark van increased speed. I must have assumed it was stop before it got to me, but it didn't. Before I could step on the brake and avoid a collision, it was too late. His van slammed into mine and my car raced off the road. I tried to control it, but it would not work. There was a road with busy signage ahead and I was heading straight for it. I looked through the rearview mirror and saw the van had parked and the driver was coming out. By the time I took my eyes back to the road, I had bumped into the signage and that was my saving grace. The steel holding the signage stopped the car from falling into the ditch. I bumped my head against the wheel and winced in pain at the impact. I looked through the mirror again and saw the driver heading towards me with something in his hand. His physique looks a bit familiar, but I waved it aside, merely assuming I had seen a lot of him lately. The way he walks too was odd, more like a lady. Then he started to run towards me, waving what was in his hand at me. I didn't see it clearly at the time because of the blood trickling down my eyes from the cut on my head. I used a hand to press against the cut to stop the blood because the Kleenex box hand had fallen off the dashboard, but my fingers got soaked in seconds. Before I could pull myself out of the car, I heard a loud bang against the wheel screen. The stalker was attacking me. Next time, leave my girl. You had to be different from the rest, and this will get you killed. Jasmine is mine. Where is she? He kept yelling as he hit the car again and again, and this was the last thing I remembered that happened that evening before I blanked out. The next time I opened my eyes, I was at the hospital. I recognized the interior of it right away. It was my workplace. At first, I was trying to place it while I was in a hospital bed instead of working on someone in it. Everything came rushing back instantly. Finally, Dave's voice filled the room and I turned my head in his direction. He was alone and I felt relief he was the only person I could trust. I narrated what had happened since the last time we spoke, finishing up with a question about his trust in the PI. He's on your side, Bradley. I have known the man for years. What exactly do they want? He asked. I wish I had an idea but why would anyone at my work feed off my details? I asked. But David did not respond because a nurse walked in at that moment. She greeted me and checked my chart. She gave me some tablets to swallow and, after this, smiled at me. She asked if I knew her, and I had to peep closer at her face. Then I saw the scar-like cut on her chin and called out her name. Bella? I sat up quickly, recognizing her. You know her? Yes, she was a freshman in med school, a friend of Phoebe's. Remember her? Sure. David nodded. Then I turned my attention back to Bella. You work here now? Of course. I asked to be your nurse when I saw you. We need to talk, Bella whispered, looking around. About what? Five years is way too long to plead for Phoebe. I turned away. Phoebe? No way. I'm not here for that. What I'm going to tell you has more to do with you and the divorce, Bella shrugged. I halted. No one at work knew about the case. How did she know? Stop staring at me. How about I start with knowing you are being stalked, and this is why you are here, she said, looking back and forth between David and me. I sensed she wanted to be assured it was safe to talk, and I informed her he was my lawyer. Are you the inside person feeding off my schedule to him? I asked, frowning at her. No way. I held a grudge against you for a while, but I understand you had to leave Phoebe because of what she did, eventually. I'm only helping you because I hate being lied to, and it is against our Hippocratic Oath, she replied. Good. So what do you have to tell me? For a start, your phones are bugged, Bella replied. Dave and I exchanged glances. Now it made sense why he knew my schedule. He had been listening to my conversation the entire time. Why and what's your relationship with him? I asked, still confused. This is when she dropped the bombshell. He is my roommate's new boyfriend, and things like this come out during pillow talk. And you know, friends talk. And he had your place bugged because he thinks you know his secret and wants it buried at all costs. Bella said. What secret? Dave and I asked. That you know where Jasmine is. Where is Jasmine? I merely assumed she was running away to avoid taking the DNA report, I asked, sitting up and peering closely at her. Oh, wow. This is getting dangerous. I'm so glad you got out of that okay, OP. That sounds horrific. 
something's really sketchy here. And it seems like Jasmine got herself into some bad business, ultimately getting you caught up in the mix. Or like you said, it's been a scam since day two. And for this guy to attack you? What the heck? Go to the police. Get the police involved. I feel like when we start snooping and really digging into something, we often get answers that we don't want to hear or uncover even more unanswered questions. I hope Jasmine's okay, despite it all. And can you even trust Bella at this point? Isn't it suspicious that she asked to take care of you? Very curious. And Jasmine missing definitely doesn't look good for her or you. I fear given the ugly divorce, you may be a suspect. Chapter 5 I was discharged the next morning after I was declared fit to go home, but was placed on 48 hours bed rest. David stopped by to drive me home, and Bella had insisted she comes with us for the medical reasons, which I knew was not entirely true. I was skeptical about having her around me, but I didn't decline, and was glad I didn't an hour later. While he drove, he called the PI to have a sweep of the bugs Bella had told us about, and he promised to do that before we got home. Then we kept trying to make sense of everything Bella had told us. Jasmine missing would not look good for the case, and I was going to be the first suspect. So despite my pain, I knew we had to do a digging of ours before our next court hearing. We got to the house but stayed in the car until the PI and his team had completely debugged the house. And I felt relieved Bella had not been bluffing and she was on our side. Thank you. I smiled at her and gave Dave a thumbs up. Bella helped me out of the car and into the house. I sat on the white couch and thanked her. David, however, suggested it would be best to leave the house pending the investigation since he knows the house already. He was right. I left to pack a few of my wares in a duffel bag quickly. When I returned, I found Dave and Bella arguing over something, with a picture frame in Bella's hand. Anything up? I had asked, dropping the bag on the center table. Is this Marianne? Bella asked, pointing a finger at Marianne, the chief bridesmaid at our wedding. I nodded. What's the issue? Exactly what I told her. I was there myself. David scoffed at Bella. Bella stared closely at the picture like she was seeing a ghost. Are you sure this was Marianne? She asked one more time. Yes, David and I replied. No, this is Jason. He's a cross-dresser, all right. I have seen him hang out at lounges and all, Bella informed me. I'm lost, I frowned, snatching the picture from her hand. I peered at the picture like I saw it for the first time. Marianne looked like a lady here, but the more I stared at her and the impression Bella had sold me, I started to see something odd. Then remembered she was a bit odd the last time we saw. I frowned. Can someone else verify this? David asked Bella. Yes, sure. We could stop by a loungy frequency and I can make a friend send you a picture of him right away to double check, Bella said. Please do, I said blinking. Bella reached for her phone in her bag and dialed a number. David and I held our fingers crossed while she talked. Hi girl, what's up? Can you do me a solid? Send me that picture we took at the lounge last week. No, no problem. I just deleted it off my phone and need it. Right away, please. Thanks, girl. See you around. She ended the call and faced us. Now we wait, she said, pacing the room. I had never been more anxious about something than I was for the next three minutes that followed. We all jumped, startled when Bella's phone chimed, notifying us of a message. She viewed it and nodded at me. I took the phone from her and viewed the picture of it. There I found a man staring back at me, the same man I had seen stalking me and had seen at the scene. When I zoomed in closer, he suddenly looked more like the woman beside Jasmine, too. My goodness! I handed the phone to Dave, and he was startled, too. Now it made more sense. There was no Marianne in the picture, just the ex-wife's lover cross-dressing at will to fool me, I laughed. Well, they fooled us all, but now we would make them pay for this, David nodded. I can't agree less, I said. This case just got deeper. Now I will have the authorities involved. This is no longer a divorce case, but a hit and run fraudulent activities, and more, David told us. I will be there to help in every way I can, Bella said, assuring me. Thanks, I said, and we locked the house and headed for David's. We went to file a missing person report at the police station the next morning, and they placed Jason and Jasmine on red alert. After the bed rest days were over, I resumed back to work, but still stayed at David's. Colleagues at work who had not suspected anything merely gave their assuring speech when they saw the notice my wife was missing. The sympathy was quite unexpected because I had not imagined they would be that concerned about my life outside the hospital. Days after this, information about Jasmine's countless fraud claims started coming out. I was shocked at the findings as David filled me in 
with the updates every evening after work. I had not seen the stalker or anything odd, and my life was finally getting its peace once more until it was not. One evening, I needed to get some stuff in my apartment and didn't want to bother David about it. I decided to drive home from work. I took the precaution the detective and David had given me. I was not being followed, nor was anyone lurking around when I got to my place. I hurriedly unlocked the door and went into the house, locking up behind me. I went to my room and went to the closet to get the folder I needed. Because I was rushing, it dropped off my hands and the papers inside it scattered on the floor. I stooped on all fours as I gathered the papers off the floor. Some were under the bed, so I reached under it and pulled them out and put them back inside the folder. When it was neatly packed again, I stood up and left the house. I checked around for anything odd like I had done earlier, found nothing. So I drove off to David's. He was back and asked why I was out late. I told him about it and I saw a worried frown crease on his brow, but it was gone immediately. I ate some fries and then sat through the files to work on it. A torn paper caught my attention. It was odd and definitely not one of mine. It was half torn, but I saw a medical report from the hospital with Jasmine's name on it. I didn't see the doctor's report completely, but I saw something about pregnancy and this got my attention because Jasmine never mentioned being pregnant to me. I checked the date to be sure it was not the same date as this current claim. It was not. I backdated it and found it was while we were together around our third anniversary. I reached for my phone and called Bella immediately. She answered on the second ring and apologized that she was with a patient earlier. I asked if she could look into Jasmine's folder and she agreed after I pleaded that she had to be discreet about it. I thanked her and hung up. I couldn't focus on my work anymore because I kept glancing at the phone hoping it would ring any second. It did eventually, and I snatched it off the table in a second. You will not believe what I just found out. She's been aborting for years and resorted to birth control last year. It is all in her record here. I will snap the file and send it to you. This is very unethical, you know, right? You can't use this in court, but I want you to see it for yourself, Bella said. I held my mouth agape, shocked by how bad Jasmine was. I got the pictures, and everything she said checked out with the reports. What was even more shocking was seeing she had another doctor attending to her aside from the one attending to us both. Where in the world is that woman? I yelled out after the call. My answer came three days later, a day to our court case. A woman whose identity I would prefer stays anonymous called and asked to see me regarding the red alert notice she saw about Jasmine and Jason. Since I had time to spare off work, I asked her to come by my office. She showed up at my work and I let her in. She told me she was not scared of being threatened by Jason anymore since she would be safer with the cops than with Jason. She told me her story, almost, and I could see it was one similar. Can I record our conversation? I asked. She nodded her approval, didn't waste time after her before doing it. She sighed and then explained the crazy cycle of how she and Jason had met 10 years ago. It was recently before my divorce. I got match made with my family friend's son and we never seemed to be on the same side since day one. I was relieved to end things but as the days went by, I became lonely with just my work to keep me busy. I was always going to a lounge to unwind and mingled. It was one of these outings that I met Jason. He made me believe he was the best man for me, swept me off my feet, and I fell hard in love with him. We were married a few weeks after we met, and he told me kids would make a mess of things, and we should leave raising them for now. My parents were pissed about it and didn't attend nor visit. I didn't care because I had all I wanted. I got promoted to the department head at the financial firm I worked at, and the pay was ten times my usual. He talked me into having a joint account with him, and I didn't see anything wrong with that. Mind you, I actually assumed he was dropping funds into it as well. He bought properties in his name. We were married. I didn't see anything wrong with that. Then one morning, I got a notification about a loan payable in three days. I had not taken any, and when I asked Jason about it, he gave me a flimsy excuse to have informed me, and I must have forgotten. He lied about a project he was trying to start, and we would be earning big from it once I kicked off. So I approved the loan, but that was the first of many. Soon we were deep in debt, and I couldn't keep up with our house and car mortgages. Jason's supposed project never came true. We were eventually kicked out of the house and lost the car. I had a mental breakdown and lost my job too. I got a job as a library assistant but that could barely supplement the bills. Jason fooled me into believing he had become a chronic gambler and the little cash I bring to the table got lost in his games. I got pregnant 
and things became even worse. As I started to approach due day, the library management made me resign because I was beginning to be more of a bother than help to them. She paused, and I offered her coffee. She declined and asked for water instead. I filled a cup at the dispenser and handed it to her. After gulping some, she dropped the cup and sighed. Because I had no longer had a place to go anymore, I had more time to be home, and I began to notice how he was always sneaking off to visit a female friend downtown. They would meet at odd places and odd times. What was more unsettling was how he dresses like a woman each time he went to see her, like they were old friends. One day, I got a closer view of this woman, and it was her. She pointed at Jasmine in the newspaper, spread out on the desk beside her. I nodded, and she continued. Then, Jason came home one night and told me he was done with the marriage and wanted out. I refused to sign the papers and showed him how I found out he had been cheating on me, being a crossdresser and misleading people. He was shocked I knew about this. To gain more grounds, I lied about knowing he never sold our properties too, but this was just a mere guess whose bait he swallowed, and I started to blackmail him in hope that I would get some of my assets back. To make sure he knew I was not joking, I had Jasmine kidnapped and told him to pay some of the money he stole from me as ransom, until I saw the alert and decided to join forces with you and bring them to book. I stared at her in shock. Yes, she is with me. I just want my money and life back, and whatever game they had going on ended, she said. Thank you, but I need Jasmine in court tomorrow, and with this swindling count added, they will surely get it right. You can open a fresh case for Jason after hours. I will ensure you get all the support you need, I assured her. She agreed and gave me the address where Jasmine was. I forwarded the recording to Dave and the PI immediately. The lady agreed to come as a witness the next day, and I couldn't feel any more relieved to have Jasmine nailed the legal way finally. Before she left my office, Dave and his men had Jasmine found and arrested. With her claim and additional evidence against Jason and Jasmine, we were able to uncover a long list of scam schemes. Jasmine was found guilty of many fraudulent counts, and Jason too. She confessed about the abortions and the pregnancy lies too. More people came forward with claims about how they cheat and swindle them of their properties. Though it had been months after the case and I had not gotten back my properties because the case was still ongoing, I was happy to have been the one to end their fraudulent games for good. If I had not taken this step, they would have gotten away with my assets and moved on to Bella's roommate. Thank you for reading. Holy crap, OP. I'm nearly speechless. What a whirlwind. She's most definitely an actress. I'm so sorry you got caught up in all this horror, OP. I can't imagine this aids in your ability to trust women any more than you did previously. No doubt this surely adds to your hatred for cheaters. I won't blame you for being a little more suspicious of people in the future. I'm so sorry that this totally uprooted your life and affected your career so negatively. I really hope that you're able to find peace after this, and I truly wish for you to find happiness and for someone to love you and respect you unconditionally. You didn't deserve this. No one does for that matter. Please stay open to love. It is out there and it will happen for you. It's not all bad and there are good people out there with good intentions. I really wanted her to be the one and I was hoping that it wasn't heading in this direction. That being said, I'm glad you're out of this nightmare alive. Wishing you all the best in your future, OP. What do you make of this? Do you have a similar story? Have you ever been swindled by a lover? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for joining us today on our space. Please be sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next video. Also, please let us know what you thought of today's content in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. See you soon.